Hey, Mr. Munyon here with uh, the embedded assessment for unit two, uh, first embedded assessment after activity 10. In this embedded assessment, we're focusing on transformations and sequences of transformations, uh, a lot of times checking or proving congruence between two shapes. So here we have uh, some description of what we can see here on this Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, of a lot of different shapes. We have a hexagonal fountain at zero, zero. It's got six sides. Each side has a length of two, so six sides. Each side is two. Short rectangular benches at zero, ten. Whoops, short at zero, ten. And longer and negative ten. And longer rectangular benches at ten, zero. Looks like we have those there. And negative ten, zero, length of eight. These were length of four. We also have a triangular statue with vertices of 5, 10, 7, 10, and what was the other one? 7, 7. Yep, so it looks like we've got that on there. Flagpoles are shown at negative 2, 10. So yeah, this little bench here does have a flagpole. And 2, negative 10, there's also a flagpole down here. All right. So why could a single, number one, why could a single translation map one of the long rectangular benches onto the other rectangular benches, but not the short ones? So why could there be one transformation uh, that maps this long bench onto the other one, but not onto the short ones? Uh, well, the easy answer is uh, because the shapes are congruent and therefore a sequence of rigid transformations will map one shape onto the other one, uh, whereas uh, one of the long benches onto the other one, whereas these are not rigid, no matter what we did out of the rigid transformations, the only way that we would be able to map is if we did a dilation and changed the size of this um, which a dilation is not a rigid transformation. So uh, that being said, let's summarize that. All right, so uh, we could definitely just uh, do a translation to the right 20 units to map this one here. But there's no way we could map the long bench onto the short bench unless we did a dilation. Um, horizontally to shrink it horizontally so yeah there is a, a set of rigid transformations that we could do for the uh, long one just translate to the right uh, 20 units but there's not a set of rigid transformations we could use for the other one so for the long benches just do a translation uh, 20 units to the right uh, and there's not a set of rigid transformations to map the long bench onto the short one for question number two, describe a rigid motion or composition that uh, maps the rectangular bench at 0, 10 and the flagpole uh, onto the other short rectangular bench and flagpole. So on this one, it has also the flagpole and it's asking how could we map this short bench and flagpole here. You can't just translate down um, because the flagpole wouldn't end up in the right spot. However, there is uh, one thing I can do. I noticed that the center is 10 units away. The flagpole's on the left side. If I was to rotate this around, the flagpole would be on the bottom and then it'd be on the right side and the center would be 10 units away. So I can actually rotate this 180 degrees about the origin is probably the easiest way to do that. Now, could you also just rotate it about the point zero ten so it stays in the same spot, that, but, but the flagpole's on the right side, and then translate down? You could do that as well, but if you can do it in one, might as well just do it in one. So we could do a rotation uh, about the origin, 180 degrees. You could go either direction, but I'm gonna put positive 180 on there. Or you could do a rotation first, about the point zero ten, one hundred and eighty 180 degrees, and then do a translation down 20 units. Uh, that one would also work, either one of those. All right. For question number three, Regina wants to know if it is possible for a composition of rigid motions to map one of the short rectangular benches onto a long rectangular bench. Uh, and it's the same reason we couldn't do number one. No, dilation is not rigid motion is the short answer for that one. All right. Um, I was trying to put an exclamation point there. Dilation is not rigid. Um, is the only way we could get the short benches to map onto the long ones. 
Okay. Uh, well, number four, one of Regina's assistants uh, glances at the plan and comments that the hexagonal shape has the greatest number of lines of symmetry of all the shapes in the plan. Is she correct? So remember a line of symmetry is a line that you could draw through a shape so that if you reflected over that line, uh, both halves would map on top of each other on the other side. So uh, really easily, I know that uh, if I was to draw you know, a line from here to here, this rectangle would flip over and map on top of itself. But, um, you know, if I drew one diagonally, it would not necessarily map on top of itself. So if I drew a line from here to here, like this point would get reflected over here. There's, it's not going to map on top of itself. So this rectangle actually only has like two lines of symmetry, vertically right through the middle and horizontally right through the middle. Same thing with this one, only two lines of symmetry. Uh, this rectangle, same thing, two lines of symmetry. Now, I don't really like this question because the way this is drawn and the way it's described aren't actually the same thing. They're not accurately kind of depicted up here. The description says all of the sides are two lengths, uh, a length of two units, but I notice on uh, like these sides, I can count and see that are two, but this side right here, if I did Pythagorean theorem and tried to calculate, you don't get two, you get two squared plus one squared is uh, four plus one is five. You get square root of five if you're just looking at the picture. However, the description does say that the units are two. Uh, square root of five is like two point, I don't know, 14 or something. Uh, but uh, the, the description does say that each of the sides is a unit of two, uh, which means that if I was to draw this line like right, here, this unit of two and this unit of two would map on top. These would map on top. These would map on top. So uh, technically, other than just being, you know, your vertical line of symmetry and your horizontal line of symmetry, you also have one here so that this would flip over on, si on each side and map. You have one here and we have one through these diagonals. So we actually have one, two, three, four, five, six total lines of symmetry. That got kind of ugly on there, but ultimately, if we're going by the description, there's six lines of symmetry on that one, which is the most out of all of the shapes. All right, so yes, there are six lines of symmetry. Number five, a landscape architect recommends installing a triangular statue with vertices at 10, negative 10, 10, negative 8, and 7, negative 10. So, looks like right here would work. 10, negative 10, 10, negative 8, and 7, negative 10. Looks good. Uh, is this triangle congruent to triangle T? Justify our answer. So uh, I feel very confident it is. Just by looking at it, it has a side of 2, 3, and it's a right triangle. This has a side of 2 and 3. So whatever the hypotenuse is, that would be the same for both of these. Uh, but I could do rigid transformations pretty easily to figure this out. So uh, if I wanted the short side on the right and the longer leg on the bottom, I could just rotate about the origin 90 degrees and then translate down uh, from there to be able to map it on top of each other. So there is a, easy, a pretty easy set of rigid transformations that I can do there. There we go. So uh, rotate 90 degree, negative 90 degrees to get it into that fourth quadrant, and then translate what looks to be one, two, three units down is what we could do for that one. So are they congruent? Yes. And what did we propose that we were going to do? Uh, we said that we were going to uh, do a rotation about the origin, negative 90 degrees, followed by translation down three units. And that would work for mapping them on top of each other. So for part B, uh, that's what we could do. And if you wanted to, to use the notation, you could put the rotation first, and then you could put the translation outside of those parentheses uh, if you wanted to do it in transformation notation there. All right, so for number six, it says another landscape architect recommends installing a triangular statue with vertices at negative 5, 10, uh, negative 5, 8, and negative 7, 8. 
uh, is this triangle congruent? And let's check it out. So negative 5, 10. So negative 5, 10, negative 5, 8. And last one, negative 7, 8. So negative 7, 8. Got this in the way again here. And is this one congruent? No. Uh, I can tell side 2, 2, side 2, 3. These aren't going to be congruent, and there's not rigid transformations. No, there's not rigid transformations. Um, Obviously, we don't have to propose rigid transformations if it's not going to map. Let me check these real quick. Negative 5, 10, negative 5, 8, negative 7, 8. So negative 5, 10, negative 5, 8, and negative 7, 8. Yep, this isn't going to work because obviously the two legs don't even match up right here. So 2 and 3, 2 and 2, not going to work for proving congruency. All right, well, I hope this gets you uh, feeling confident about your uh, transformations and prove, being able to prove things congruent. The biggest thing you need to know is how to do transformation notation, how to actually do these transformations, and that the only way you can prove congruency uh, using transformations is there has to be a sequence of rigid transformations to prove congruency. You can't use dilations because that changes the size of the shape. They wouldn't be congruent figures. All right, uh, if you haven't already done the Activity 10 homework, uh, make sure you check the homework schedule to see what you need to do there. Also, I'll see you guys on Activity 11.